Hello, hello, and welcome to episode three of the All Gunners podcast. It is me, Harry Carnu, presenting for the first time in our lifetime, very, very short lifetime of this podcast. Uh, but listen, uh, I just want to bring in our uh, uh, panel today, and I am absolutely excited just per the Twitter um announcement earlier that we have the legendary the one and only graham brooks also known to be the main tactical guy on AFTV. graham how are we my friend hello mate yeah it's a real privilege to be on your pod i wouldn't say legend i think that's a bit generous but um uh, Graham, you know we are fans of yours and we will call you whatever we want. And if I say <laughs> legend, then it's, it's yeah, legend. Yeah, look, uh, Harry said it's great to be on your pod and I'm looking forward to chatting, breaking down uh, everything Arsenal with you tonight. Thanks for the invite, thank you. guys. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. And listen, uh, we wouldn't be all gunners if we didn't have our very own, also legendary, but not so much le- legendary, our own Zed. How are we doing, Zed? Oh, we're doing good, mate. Honestly, don't call me that. <laughs> you dream not even close, right? <laughs> we, we, Listen, we've got Graham here, right? He's, he's, he's the main man. He's the guest we today, are in right? All. We are in we, all. We are in all. We're fans. We're fans. We've got to keep you on your best behaviour tonight, so we've got to give you some uplift, haven't we, Zed? Yeah? Um, yeah, you know what? Keep keep me on my toes. That, that's it. Exactly, exactly. Thanks, Zed. And and listen, I want to say, uh, you know, it's the first time that I'm presenting this, so uh, you know, uh, I hope it goes well because it's a, it's my it's my first time doing this. But uh, I thought, well, let's give it a go. Mate, you're gonna smash it. Don't worry. You've you've, you've <laughs> gone off to a great great start. The, the, Thank just you. just just the intro, intro of Graham has got me floored. You you you're it, mate. Well, let's not keep you all hanging because Graham's time is very, very precious. Uh, And look, Graham, as we do on all of our shows, and uh, just a reminder to our audience is that this is a very open, loose show. We talk about Arsenal, everything Arsenal, absolutely everything and anything Arsenal. But what we want to do is we want to open this up to as many people as possible. Now, you're a well-known guy on the YouTube scene. The first that... um, Certainly, I identified uh, of you. I was, I, I, you know, was blown away really by just the way that you'd come out of Arsenal games on AFTV and just blow it away, literally with the tactical insight. And and I'd think to myself, do you know what? That's absolutely right. Exactly how he said it there is exactly how I saw that. But the way you articulated things, Graham, was was brilliant. And I just want to start by asking you, as we ask all of our guests that um, will be coming on, and you are our first guest as well, so it's um, we're privileged to have you, is how did you get into Arsenal? How long have you been a gunner? Was it a family connection? Um, were you forced into it? You know, t- tell us about how you got into uh, being Arsenal. I've been an Arsenal fan, Harry, for about 50 years now. Um, wow. And uh, the reason was my dad. Uh, it's uh, My dad was a massive Arsenal fan uh, who originally lived in London and moved down to Kent. Uh, and I was born in Maidstone. Uh, but dad always kept his love for Arsenal. Um, they weren't very rich, my mum and dad, but my dad took me to Highbury uh, in 1970, 71. I think it was the, the season of the double when I was absolutely hooked that uh, the marble halls of Highbury, my first game, I can remember him selling peanuts. He bought me a packet of peanuts. I can remember the shirts. I was in love with the shirts from the start. And just my first experience of going to Arsenal overwhelmed me. And uh, it was drummed into my dad, really. We didn't go very often. As I say, he didn't have a lot of money, but started following the team. And my love of Arsenal grew from there. I mean, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm more a cricketer than a footballer. I played in the Kent League for 25 years. Really? I never knew wow. that, Graham. Yeah, so you know I, that, I was then? a cricketer, right? No, 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 I was no. also a captain of a cricket club. So so because of that, I suppose, because I was always tactically into cricket, uh, yes. it's, it's sort of like, that's really why tactically, I suppose, I'm interested in football as well. I must admit, in the, in the early days, I wasn't so much tactically into football. I loved my club. Arsenal's the love of my life, really even though I'm more a cricket fan than a football fan, but Arsenal has been the love of my life. And I've been fortunate I've been able to pass that love on to my son, Cameron, who uh, we shared wonderful memories when he was growing up from when he was 
uh, nine or ten to the age of 20 up to the pandemic really he hasn't been so much since but we had 10, 11 wonderful years sharing Arsenal together and, and they have memories I'll take with me for the rest of my life. So the, the, the love of Arsenal for me came from my dad. I've been fortunate to pass it on to my son. First season I followed the club, we won the double, which was fantastic. To actually be uh, at Wembley, which uh, he got me a ticket for that game when Charlie George wow. scored the winner. One of my great memories. Uh, I remember Charlie George scoring the goal past Ray Clements. I don't know if you were younger audience might not remember it. If they look it up on YouTube, they'll see him hit a right foot shot right in the corner past Ray Clements and then he literally lay on his back and the team come and picked him up. I was so enthused with that. I practiced it in the playground when I went back to school, ripped a few school jackets that my parents weren't too happy about sort of laying on the ground. But, uh, so my love for Arsenal came from there. I can remember in 72, I cried when we lost the Leeds in the following cup final. I got so upset. Uh, but my love for Arsenal has been there all along. And uh, obviously I started going regularly when I was older, up until I got married, really, I was going virtually every home game and a lot of away games. Obviously, didn't go so much when I got married, uh, although I was still obviously massively in love with the club and went when I could. And then, of course, uh, when we moved to the Emirates, my son came along and then uh, we started going together. So, But in answer to your question, the love of Arsenal came from my father. Mm. Mm, that's interesting um, because uh, we, we've all got different stories, but it just reminded me of, of Zed when we, we, we initially did our intros and how we got into Arsenal, and you yeah. can find that on, on episode one. You were cricket as well, weren't you, Zed? Yeah, initially? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I, I was very much into my cricket as well. I wasn't even actually into football. It, it wasn't until I got cornered in people asking me, as I said in episode one, like, what team do you support? We're talking about football, not cricket. And I couldn't run away. <laughs> so, And it, it was just Arsenal. <laughs> and, that, and that was it. An interesting it connection boring. as well that there, that Graham, you said that um, you, 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 because cricket is a very tactical game. I mean, I, I love cricket as well, to be fair. So we've got three cricket lovers on, but you're absolutely right. But, but Zed similarly is into the tactics as well. We, we, we're non-stop talking tactics, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's just a part of the game, isn't it? In cricket, you're very much every ball. There's a tactic behind that ball, right? And the field sets, the the position of the bat, the ball you're gonna pull, where you're gonna pitch it, the pace, slow ball, fast ball. So it's it's very tactical, and every moment of it is tactical. That's the beauty of Test match cricket, right? Yeah. And that's what what I like, and that's why when I looked into football, when I got into football, that's why my love was for stats, for the uh, for the tactics as well. I mean, I, I have to say, uh, Graham, that um, I, I nearly fell off my chair when you told me you've been supporting. You. So you're over 50 years old. What are you eating, mate? Because you look, I could not even tell that you were 50 full stop, mate. What are you, you know? Well, I've just you, celebrated my 60th birthday. Eric. Wow. Whoa. I tell you what, Zed, if we're looking like that at 60, right, we're doing something <laughs> right. <laughs> Can hey, I, I, I would have won the lottery. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say that the beauty about it is that I was born on Christmas Day 61, um, which was seven months after Tottenham won, last won the league title. They've never won the league title in my lifetime. And I always joke that I hope to get off the planet before they win it again. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so I was, uh, you know, uh, I love the banter about Tottenham. So people who know me <laughs> know, know that I love the banter about Tottenham love Hotspur. Me. But, love you know, me. I'm 60 years old and... Um, you know, I'm starting to feel it. I might, you might think I might not look it. I, I probably don't look it uh, on screen, but if you saw me up close, my wife would say I look every, every inch of sixty. Well, not every inch, but every mark of no, sixty. No, no, and and no. I certainly feel it at times. I have to say. I, I, I believe you, but you, you definitely need to share later offline the secrets of what you have for breakfast every day, my friend, because uh, you, you do, you're looking well, camera or no camera. Um, so, Graham, we, look, we know you, uh, as I say, I said in the intro, we know you from, in the main, um, AFTV, Arsenal Fan TV. I initially, I'm sure Zed did too, saw you on your initial fan cams and, and we, 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 we've always been fans. We've been blown away. We know you do some other shows as well, don't you? You do the Technical Insight show on AFTV. Same old Arsenal and, and a bit of Lee Judges. Um, yes, yeah, that's, right. that's correct, yeah. I think things have kind of blown up for you, though, haven't they, since you were recognised on AFTV? We, what we want to know is, is just a little bit around how, you know, what happened that first instant um, that um, that you, you you were on AFTV, how you were identified, et cetera, et cetera, because it's fascinating for me. Yeah, I think, I, actually, the thing is, I didn't originally want to go on AFTV. That is, the, that is true. Um, what happened was uh, 
2013, we signed Meza Ozil. Mm. And me and my son were going to the game, uh, which was his first match at home. I think he played the previous week at Sunderland and we won that game. And he was outstanding that match. It was his first home game. Can't remember who it was against. But there was a German TV company actually outside the ground. And me and his son had been in the armory. I think I bought him one of his 20 or 30 Arsenal tops, I think, I've bought him over the years. And I always said I would never contribute to the Cronkies until we won a league title. My last shirt is the 2004 shirt, the Invincible shirt. But, I, of course, they, they got me through my son. But we, I bought him a shirt and we walked up to the stadium and there was a, a German TV company there who were interviewing people, as it turned out, about Meza Ozil. Um, so we stood there watching it and uh, he asked me, the guy, the interview, if I would, Say some words about Mesut Ozil. So, um, and they, apparently they were going to put it out on German TV. Uh, I, I still don't know if I was selected, but they said they would dub it into German. So, I'd love to see myself dubbed into German on German TV. I don't think it was a. a I think it was a regional program. I think. But um, anyway, so he asked me a few questions about Mesut Ozil. Uh, obviously, I knew about Mesut Ozil, world class footballer. Remember him making his mark in the 2010 World Cup against England, for example. So, I, you know, it was like a marquee signing for Arsenal. We were all excited when he came. So I did that interview about him on that uh, channel, just a few questions. Um, I can remember talking to my son. He asked me, did I, he, he said to me, there's AFTV. Do you want to do an interview for AFTV? He was trying to get me. He was only about 10 at the time, 10 or 11, but he had obviously watched it. I hadn't watched it. Uh, and he showed me the famous interview with... Uh, uh, I think it was Chris Hudson who, who, who was the first big interview, I think, that that, that really sort of went uh, virtual, you know, all, all around YouTube. And then he showed me Claude and Mo. I've got a lot of respect. I, I got to know Claude really well. It's really sad what happened to him. I think he was, he was a lovely guy. He was uh, and me and him were great. He, he had a lot of nice, positive things to say about me. And, and then also Mo. I've got a lot of respect for Mo. Yeah, yeah, I know Mo. Unfortunately, the way it ended with, uh, with Mo, um, but that's not my, nothing to do with me, obviously. Yeah, and I still fair. count Mo as a friend uh, and, uh, you know, I have still watch what he does and follow him. Um, but ultimately, my son talked me into it. So around 2016, I think, 2015, it was, it was, it, it was I didn't go on it for a while. I think he was, talking me into it for a couple of years. I, I, I looked at it and I thought, I can't go on there. It's just people ranting. That's not what I do, you know. Um, and eventually, I think I went in, did a couple. Um, and they weren't sort of like anything great. It was just me coming out and just talking, trying to talk about the game, really. And, and um, so from those early ones, I, you know, I didn't think that I would carry on doing it. Well, I think it was the start of the 2016 season where I, suddenly sort of like, you know what, um, I enjoy watching these games and why don't I take my thoughts from the games tactically onto this channel? That's what I started to think about because mm. I enjoyed, when I watch the game, when you're in the stadium, you see things in the stadium up high where I sit, I sit above where Arteta stands on the touchline. So you can see the whole pitch, you can see players' movements, you can see formations, shapes. And I started thinking, wouldn't it be great for someone to come on and just give their view tactically of what happened in the game. You know, what went wrong, what went right. Um, because because nobody was do doing it. this, Graham. Nobody was doing that at the time. It was exactly. all emotions. No, no one was you, doing you, that. And I thought, you've got, you've, you've got your, your troops and your DT emotional yeah. kind of rants, which yeah. were kind of getting views, but no one was doing that, were they? No, it, it was it was a against the grain sort of thing, you know, because at the time, AFTV was famous for just rants, you know, DT and troops and Claude. Uh, and it was all, everything was totally different to, to the way I saw football, wanted to talk about football. So, but I, I you know, from, from my point of view, it's not as if it, uh, it was a risk at all, because if people didn't like it, they didn't like it. So, mm. but the funny thing is, I, I the first few I did when I started coming out of the stadium and sort of like talking tactically about the game, I suddenly got a lot of good reviews. Um, first of all, I think because people were surprised that someone could talk articulately about football on AFTV. <laughs> 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 and then also people started thinking you know what this i want to hear more of this guy he's sort of like saying things about the game that i enjoy talking about as well so i i, I think there's if you look at it i always say that on most platforms there's room for everybody so there's room for people who want to come out and be passionate and 
just don't understand understand the game tactically, but just want to have a rant. There's room for people who want to talk tactically about the game. There's room for people who just want to have a football discussion, you know. So there's, and I think Robbie uh, does now cater on AFTV. I think the way he's grown the channel now is, you look at the people he's brought on the channel. He employs now because I'm not employed by AFTV. I just I'm like a freelancer really. So, um, but um, he's got a, a broad base now, pretty much every corner covered, you know. So yeah. So the, the channel, some people might think it's a bit weak now because some of the originals, and I wasn't one of the originals, but I was looking back when I first went on there. It's about 15 people. There was a, a, a painting a guy in Africa did of the channel that he sent to Robbie that he put on, up on the website for a while. And there's only about five or six of us left from that original painting now. It was like, apart from Robbie, you know, there's sort of like myself, Lee Judges, uh, Pepper. Um, I'm just trying to think of the names now. And most most people have gone, you know, who were in that, you know, obviously one or two, sadly, like Heavy D and Claude have passed away. Yeah. Obviously, we know what happened to DT uh, the other yeah. week, which we don't want to go into. That. No, no, no. Uh, and, and then, and obviously, Troops was the big success of the channel. He's now in America. Yeah. Mo, obviously, another disappointing the way that ended because Mo was a really nice guy. But there's, there's, if you look at it now, there's, I'm just trying to think who there are. There's, sort of, I think there's like Kalechi myself. I mean, Bully was on the channel. For a while, and he yeah he left the yeah. channel after a while. Uh, but it's like Kalechi, myself, Ty, Pippa, and Lee Judges, and Robbie. And, um, off the top of my head, they're the only ones I can remember from that photograph. But um, yeah, so I think the thing is, I I started to get well liked in, and my views were quite low at the time, but I was well liked. Robbie said to me, "Could you go on to Instagram and build your profile up a bit, you know, and sort of like get yourself onto Twitter." Because I wasn't even on Twitter at that stage. Really? So I wow. literally got onto because I'm not a social media person. I'm a sort of like old school, really. So um, I got onto Twitter, got onto Instagram, and then of course people started to really see a lot of the videos. Uh, and I think Robbie said to me that uh, basically, you know, um, he's getting a lot of pressure to people wanting me to have my own show or to do something because they enjoyed really? what I was doing. The views. Oh, wow. Higher. So he literally said to me, how do you fancy doing a tactical show? Because um, obviously he he sort of like started, whenever I came on, he knew he was going to be talking tactics with me in the interview. Yes. So, yeah. so he asked me basically, would I like to do a tactical show? And I said, yeah, it would be great. So uh, the first one we did, we actually recorded it like this, sort mm -hmm. of like Robbie was in his house in Milton Keynes. I was in uh, my house where I live. Uh, I live in a place called Borden, a village called Borden, which is near Sittingbourne. In Kent, and, and basically, we just did a, a 35 40 minute on the Crystal Palace game in 2018, the famous game where Jacker scored the free kick. Uh, we drew two all in our green kit, I remember that. Yeah, so um, that was the first one. And then he said, because at the time, AFTV had a studio near Trafalgar Square in London, he said, You know, uh, I could do it on a whiteboard in a room, and you yeah. could come up. So we pro progressed to the whiteboard. I was still doing fan cams, of course. So I'd, I'd come out the ground, do very basic fan cam, and then I'd go up on the Monday and do a, a show um, in London about 30, 40 minutes, uh, which I would prep, uh, and then I'd set it up on a whiteboard. And, uh, you know, obviously we just talk tactics, you know, but it'd be much driven by what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, now, at the time, people liked it, but a lot of people were saying, this guy needs to have a bit of technology. Why can't you just get magnets or something like that, you know? Yeah. So then we went from the whiteboard to uh in a, a recording room we had up there where we put like magnets up on a board and i started moving magnets around and then there was a cry for technology so basically then we we went to the technology of using like a, a tactical ipad on on a, on a computer i remember that yeah. yeah yeah so so that was the first one so we started doing that and then unfortunately just as we started doing that the uh um the pandemic came along and yeah, as a result yeah. of that we stopped it and then by then obviously what happened to me personally was my mum was taken was coming to the end of her life so I'd sort of like and there was no football to go to anyway so um I was looking after my mum by then Robbie had sort of like revamped the channel brought along one or two younger faces the freshen up like Cecil and James who come along and done really well on the channel James is obviously like me very tactical uh, and mm, yeah. then he had this idea of putting us together. So, so, so I went from working with Robbie, which I used to enjoy working with Robbie, uh, to working with James. But James has taken it to another level. 
uh, on the show and, and, and how we work now is that um, just I'll quickly run you through this so how it works is that you know I'll either be at a game or watch a game uh, and then basically I will send him uh, on, on WhatsApp my thoughts on the game tactically what I saw on the game uh, and one or two stats around to around the arguments that I'm trying to make about the game or points I want to make about the game he then takes the bits that he thinks we can use uh, and we use he's the one who works the tactical pad the one who works it all out so and puts it together yeah. then i come up and just talk around what he's put together based on what he wants to run with and that's basically the format we use now so it is prex to do a, a show like that for half hour 40 minutes i couldn't just turn up and we do it without first of all having a guy there who sets it up for us him to actually no. do the do the, the bit that he does and for me to talk but it is all prepped so we all when i get there he talks about what we're going to do how we what we're going to run with uh, and then i he has a little segment that he wants to talk about so so basically that's how it's evolved but it, it's come from that really from the fan cams people like what i did and to be honest the views on the tactical show i think most of the season have been really good from a hundred thousand peaked about hundred and twenty thousand. it's i would say it's average is about sixty five seventy thousand which i think is really good for a show of that type yeah you know so because most people like the Thai stuff you know the sort of like what Thai does you know because they like a bit of fun but you know i, I you know, i'll get complimented from fans from other clubs you know who message me and say really enjoy what you say about arsenal not just about arsenal about our club uh, and also you're great at what you do so that makes me feel good you know uh that, that people got value out of it and that's that's why i like doing it yeah now graham it's it's absolutely brilliant honestly the what once you touched on it's a different kind of um a show compared to other people's just emotional views which obviously it's enjoyable to watch as well but people like me who really enjoy the stats and really enjoy the you know breakdown of the games how it was played the tactics that kind of show is really really interesting and honestly mm. you do a wonderful wonderful job and every time it's on i'm just watching even if i'm working i'm on the side just you know <laughs> i've got my headphones on i'm like okay all right yeah this is good this is good right so a lot of the things I have to admit, I've picked up how to analyze games from watching you. So that's when I say mm -hmm. I'm a fan. I actually literally, literally mean it. It's it's a big it's a big thing. Uh, so it's it's pretty pretty good when you do that kind of show. And honestly, your progression it gives it gives insight to how it's been done. And every single yeah, I, think, I think yeah, what I try to do is I try to look at a game and try and take the main part tactically out the game yeah and then build something around that i'm not saying i'm always correct when i did the last tactical show against burnley the way yeah. i sort of analyzed the burnley game the way i thought our problem was the the, the midfield uh the, the single pivot i thought laconga yes. yeah yeah had struggled in that game uh and and, and also <clears throat> obviously we struggled with the lacazette's role of having to come deep to build the play for midfield but, yeah one or two guys who messaged me disagreed with me, uh, which is fine. I've got no problem with somebody having a point of view, you know, because at the end of the day, I'm I'm only seeing it from how I see. I'm not saying I get everything right. Um, and James as well, he sometimes doesn't always agree with what I say, uh, yeah. but we do it respectfully. And I always think it's great to talk tactics, and we can disagree uh, as long as you respect everybody's point of view. Football. What I love about football, guys, is it, it's a game of opinions, you know. Yes. Even tactically, you know, you might see something that I don't see, and you might disagree on something I'm saying. I might disagree on something you're saying, but that's the beauty of the game, you know. So, uh, and you know, but what I try to do is I sort of like take one main point out of a game. I think was the reason, mm -hmm. or I analyse something uh, like the Man City game. I analyse the way that we stopped Man City building up uh, with Rodri from the back. Yeah, and the way we sort of pressed on, and and the way we pressed on, stopped them from building up, um, and we forced them to go long to uh, Mares and Sterling a lot in those games, and we had players like Tommy Asu who, who could win those duels all day long. I thought that was a crucial part of the game, so I focused on it. A bit like Burnley, I focused on the way that Arsenal tried to build up through Lukonga and the way yeah. why it didn't work, you know. So, um, so, and I do think we've had troubles this year sometimes with low block teams, but. Um, that's what I try to do, and then we build it up around that. I try to make these shows entertaining with James. So what we do is mm -hmm. we have a lot of uh, pictures as well, a lot of stats to, yeah, um, and a lot of, uh, um, you know, we we try to develop things around it to make it as interesting as we can. 
I it, mean, it, it provides was... context. It provides context for uh, for someone watching the video. It's not just numbers being chucked out. It, that that's one of the beauties of your show, is that mm. you get context of all the stats and what you're talking about on screen. So, because when when you speak some stats, doesn't necessarily mean the people will follow it. No. Yeah, I mean, basically, we try and back up everything. If we're trying to make a point, we we try and back it up with fact. You know, mm. so. Uh, I'm always looking for something to back up an argument, you know, so, um, and that's what what we do when we prepare it, and James does the same, you know, so, you know, so that's that's what we try to do. We try and do it in an interesting way, try to vary it slightly if we can. It's it's um, a show, I think, that, you know, I, I think is evolving still. I'm really yeah. pleased with where it's got to from where it started from. I think James is really fantastic, really. Uh, you know, he's, he's he's probably the best thing that happened to AFTV, in my opinion. And you think? I prefer you, Graham. If I'm he, with you. <laughs> I can see, and you know, I look at people around in who I've worked with, like Harry Simu on Same Old Arsenal, James on AFTV. Yeah. I think they're good enough to be in. You know, they they almost like journal. I mean, Harry's almost like a journalist now, anyway. But I think, and James went to uh, university and learned uh, journalism. So they, these guys could easily have a career beyond what they do now yeah, uh, yeah. in what they do because they're just really talented. So, And it's a privilege to actually share a platform with Harry on Same Old Arsenal and to work with James. So, um, do you, do you yeah, so I, I'm, you know, I really, it's, it's come a bit late in my life for me, really, but I'm enjoying it and I love doing it. All the time people enjoy listening to me, uh, I'll carry on doing it. But if people, and obviously I'm grateful to AFTV, you gave me, Robbie, you gave me the platform. And obviously, like all good things, everything's got a cycle in life and it comes to an end. So, but I'm enjoying it. Uh, and as long as I carry on joining people like what I do, I carry on doing it. Yeah, so Graham, I mean, I, I must admit that um, your, uh, your, your tactical analysis is, is, is far superior. I think, I think James is good. I think he, he's good with the reliance of stats. He uses stats a lot more than you do. Uh, but I think where your talent is, Graham, is that you've got the ability to um, watch a game, walk out of a game and just be able to talk about what you saw, which is a rare talent, to be fair. I, I, it's, it, not many people have got that. And I think that's that's certainly where I think a lot of your views have come from, because you just are able to just talk about it without having to uh, sit down and research. You just talk. And, and I think that's that's a brilliant talent. Yeah, I think it comes partly because, obviously, uh, I've watched a lot of football in my time, haven't I? So um, I think it comes from having watched a lot of football, being able to understand the game over a number of years, uh, and also being really interested now in watching um, the game, you know. And and it, I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm still passionate when I'm in the stadium, you know, I still sort of like like everybody else if uh an arsenal player misses an open goal i i react in the just like an ordinary fan uh, so uh, so sometimes it's good to sort of like um watch a game back i do watch games back so i have to be honest um i can come out of the ground and just put very what i would call points that i saw in the game but if i really want to put a tactical piece together for the tactical insight show i will watch a game again without the raw emotion of being a fan watching the game. So, um, yeah, yeah, uh, but, um, but, you know, I can come out. Oh, yeah, you are right. I could probably do that. But I think James is, um, I think James does. You are right. He uses stats, but he is, he's a very intelligent and good at what he does. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. And I, I mean, I, just finally, before we sort of move on, I, 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 I'd say sort of talk, talk about AFTV as a wider phenomenon is when I when I was more into watching AFTV, there'd be it, it it'd be game dependent, wouldn't it? Because it'd be depending on if we if we won or lost or or, or yeah. drew. Um, yeah. So so I, I troops was generally a go to for me. Um, and and Zed, I'll get your views on this in a second as well. Troops was because obviously he was one of the mainstays and big ranter. DT as well. Often, if you wanted to see a, a, a rant, DT and troops would be my general go-to. Um, but you brought in that kind of actually, whether we won, lost, or drew, I'd always be, you'd be my my number 
three in respect of actually I want to know a little bit more about how this tactically went and I want to know if Graham agrees with me or I agree with with Graham so you you'd be up there and then number four I mean definitely somebody like Lee Judges would be up there but I'd always listen to Mo because Mm. win lose or draw Mo would always be that voice of reason and that's not to say I mean it's you know it's like you said earlier isn't it Graham that um we're still fans, aren't we? And we still overreact or we underreact or we unreasonably react. But what I'd find from Mo is, is he'd always be that calm, reasonable person. And actually, you're right, it is such a shame that he's no longer on the channel. But he'd speak, he, I'd always think, and I, I met him because he came to Wolverhampton um, when when uh, Arsenal playing Wolves away some, some years ago. And I said to him, I said, do you know something, Mo? I always listen to your your clips because you sp- you're the voice of reason on AFTV. And do you know what he said to me? He goes, "I bet, mate. You, I bet you say that to everybody, all of them." I says, "No." <laughs> and and Turkish is another one, actually. <laughs> Turkish. That th- those four or five people are generally. But for that, you brought a new element to it because it wasn't about rants. It wasn't about oh gosh, we lost. It's us. It's um, Cronky's out or Wenger out at the time or Arteta or whatever. But it was always about actually. I, I do, especially when we won. I really want to educate myself on how we won, and so I thank you for that, Graham. Zed, what about you? I mean, I, I know I probably have watched more AFTV than you have. I know you're a little bit of a closet fan over the years, but but, uh, but, but where's Graham? Where's where's Graham fitting for you? Uh, so I think I have watched, to be fair, a lot of AFTV. For me, it wasn't more the reactions. I think for me, the video I would look forward to most would be the uh, scoring, right? What what each player was given. That that was very interesting yeah. because I wanted to see people's point of view on individual performances. Right, so I, I all wanted to see, and especially when Xhaka turned up, that was always an interesting one to watch because yeah, <laughs> he would always yeah. do something interesting. So, you know, those zeros being dropped every now and then was <laughs> very, very, very interesting. So, for me, I think that was the best one. That, that was my go to video. And obviously, as I said, I learned more about football and tactics by watching Graham's responses to games. Right, mm. so because I, I wasn't into my T4 or the athletic and all of that kind of stuff before. Because I was just like, oh, okay, this is a bit of fun. Let's watch that 10-minute video, and I'll know about the game. And that's about it. I wasn't very much into the rants, because I could only listen to the rants for so long. And yeah. then, so I was more into, okay, what the points were being given. So individual performances were very uh, good for me. And then after watching Graham, I got more into the tactic side. As you know, it's despite, you know, just stats all the time now. That's because I got into my, what you call the athletic and just started to understand more about what football was rather mm. than just the raw emotion of football. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's what it was for me. It's fair to say, Graham, that um, you've, you've definitely changed the face of how we respond to football. And, and not just, obviously, yourself and your fan cams, but AFTV as a, as a whole, really, and, and looking at who has developed and come up with channels since then. I mean, we we, we ourselves may not have started on, on YouTube and, and, and beyond if if, uh, if it wasn't for these. So, yeah, no, look, thank you for that. And and I, I guess we've got to move on because we could be talking about this sort of, but we really want to get the <laughs> nitty gritty of your, of Graham's tactical analysis of what's uh, currently going on. And, and, and I mean, I think it's it's fair to say that when we were doing our prep for this, Zed, this was going to we're thinking about towards the end of January. Yeah. Um, we 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 kind of earmarked episode three for um, a response to the transfer window. Uh, yes. But we can cover that in thirty seconds because there is no response to the transfer window. <laughs> let's be quite honest there. There was no, there was no significant or anything that we can talk about in terms of outgoing. So we won't even need to cover the transfer window on this pod uh, until the next window opens. But one significant um, exit, because um, I think it's fair to say that this transfer window was used as a, as a clear out, and it's fair to yeah. say that there's there's quite a few names that had been cleared out, but. Um, the, the, the name that would strike probably the most significant uh, movement out is the name of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. 
um, who, to be fair, has has set the club alight from the day that he uh, came. I'm, I personally will say to to our audience that he uh, excited me as much as Mesut Özil did all those years ago um, when he joined the club. But just yep. as it didn't end great for Mesut Özil, it didn't end great for Aubameyang at the club as well, did it, Zed? No, no, it did not. Uh, honestly, we touched on it last episode as well. Uh, it's a bit sad. Well, I'll, I'll say a bit. It's actually very sad, right? Because mm. his attitude and smile when he got onto the field was something else. The vibe that he brought to the club was just brilliant, right? From the moment he signed, and I told you this before, I, I followed a, a bit of German football and Dortmund was my team. So yeah. having watching him play in for Dortmund under Tuchel was just brilliant. He, and, and the best season all, when he was beating Lewandowski to the Golden Boot, I was I was truly, truly happy because mm. he was the underdog. And when asked, honestly, I could not believe that Arsenal signed him, but it's just ended really poorly, really. And and it's it's been a bit of a theme for Arsenal. And obviously, this is where we want to get Graham's view on what he thinks mm. of uh, Oba's exit. Graham, first couple of years, Oba was on fire. Uh, we don't need technical expertise to know that because we passionately all saw those goals flying outside of the box, inside of the box, tappings. He had it all, didn't he, Graham? Uh, but it's fair to say in, in, the, in the last... I mean, look, people are always going to say since he signed his contract, it, it's gone downhill. I don't, I, I don't think I personally believe it's because of the contract, but certainly the timing is key. Graham, what's, what's gone wrong for Aubameyang at Arsenal? It's a, it's a, it's a, obviously, uh, first thing I'll say, guys, is that um, it really hit me two days after he went. Uh, mm. I, mem- I remember sort of waking up and thinking, God, he's actually gone. And, and it really, although he hadn't been part of the team since December the 6th, to lose a player, albeit I know he's on the wane, but still a top forward in my eyes. It would give me so much pleasure as an Arsenal mm. fan. And mm. I can think of two instances uh, that really were, you know, I mean, there's so many, but the goal against Tottenham in the North London oh, derby. Oh. You beat me to it, Graham. You beat me to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, it was a first time shot with his right foot, which oh, went in the corner and got us. Amazing finish. And he scored another, he scored another goal against, I remember, we steered a Gunduzi. That was when we won 4 2, that. That great day, uh, and the other one we steered a Guendouzi pass in the net against Tottenham. You know, it doesn't. It helps your cause, of course, if you score against Tottenham as an Arsenal fan. And obviously, oh. he won. He won us the FA Cup. Whatever you say, he gave Arteta his first trophy. The um, the goals in the semi final uh, against Man City and the two in the final. So, you know, wonderful memories. I think. Where did it go wrong for Pierre Aubameyang? Um, I think he suffered really uh, through. The problems we had as a team uh, and um, I think the problem was in moving to the system that uh, Arteta moved to I think was at the expense of, of uh, uh, the abilities that Aubameyang had that he had to change the way he played yeah um, and work back more in a defensive sort of like position because he obviously um, if, uh, and I'll compare it to what I can say is if you think back to when uh, Emery was uh, in charge. Uh, remember, the, Aubameyang was our te- uh, was a uh, Wenger's last ever signing, um, and he started scoring goals for fun when he first came along. I was there when he scored his opening goal against Everton. But what uh, Emery did is he fitted the team in around Lacazette and Aubameyang. So there was a, there's a key difference here. I think that year, eighteen nineteen, they had something like seventy one goal involvements. I, I forget the numbers. That's that's goals and assists between them in that season it was quite phenomenal they both had great seasons i might be wrong with the numbers but i know it was high so that's where the team was at that stage but the problem was uh, the uh, although we were scoring goals we were conceding big chances and shots at goal uh, and so when emery eventually lost the dressing room and went i think the team which was built around lacazette and bamman which obviously were the two assets in the team uh, the crown jewels you you would say but Arteta wanted to change it. He wanted to stop teams from having shots at our goal. He wanted us to be, he wanted us to, all co- he wanted to coach us more in the way we played out from the back, the way we pressed from the front. And I know Emery, Emery had always hinted at going in that direction as well. 
But I think Arteta obviously brought more to it. And, and I think that came at the expense of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. And ultimately, Aubameyang's a player who likes to play on the shoulder, who likes to play in behind uh, and likes to be played through. And I know Odegaard is good at doing that, but I think the team evolved away from the way Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang plays. And so as a result, that's why we saw a dip in his numbers. I also think he wasn't helped by the fact that in that third season, pandemic came along and Arsenal were playing to empty stadiums because he plays with a smile on his face. He plays the stadiums, doesn't he? He's a, he loves interacting with the fans and he didn't have that. So I think that affected him as well. I think ultimately he became a victim of the way Arsenal wanted to change in the way they played. And I think Martinelli does more now from that left-hand side than he probably could. And that's the position I think Arteta wanted to play him. But for all that, to sell him and not have something lined up to replace him. Yeah. I know we got, got 29 million off the wages for six months, but to, to release him. And I'm not, uh, when you, you're playing Lacazette, who's only got three goals all season, two from open play, and Aketia, who has only got five Premier League goals in 43 appearances, albeit a lot from the subs bench. Hmm. I know you've got Martin, Martinelli you can move around up front, but I think it's a huge risk. Um, and and obviously he became a victim of of, of discipline. Uh, the fact that um, Arteta wants to change the culture of the club, he doesn't want young players to be um, influenced by players who don't follow the, what he sees as the, the non-negotiables. And... Um, and as a captain and a leader, a senior man, he wants that more than ever from the likes of Aubameyang. And, and whatever you say about Aubameyang, I think he's always had that throughout his career. Or he has had problems at various clubs with his timekeeping, his discipline. There's and, a pattern uh, there, isn't there? Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. there is a pattern there. So it's very sad, really, because I think, I think he's one of the, in the top three or four players of the Emirates era. I really do think that. Um, uh, not quite as technically great as Van Persie, not up there with the, you know, I love Alexis Sanchez and, and I love Meza Ozil, but he's certainly in my top five. And uh, and I think I just want to remember the great things that he brought to the club, uh, you know, and he, he, whatever you say, he delivered that trophy, the FA Cup, against he the did. odds in 2020. So that's why I want to remember him. It's terribly sad. I do think that if we were going to release him, and I know it's come out of nowhere because it's only a few months ago that Arteta was praising him for his work off the ball and all that. And uh, we were seeing, you know, he was captain after all. Um, but if you're going to replace him, you can't get in the guy you want. I think you've got to try and get in a lone player. And But we couldn't do it, could we? And I, I, I do applaud the club for not going out and buying players who we don't want because we've made those mistakes in the past, you know, made wrong signings. And that's why we, you know, we, we are where we are as a football club, apart from, you know, uh, not being able to get players to renew contracts. But we have made some poor signings. And, and and we don't want to go down that route again. But for all that to be on the fringes of the top four possible Champions League and now to go into the last 17 games without a Bamiang up front yeah. as an option is, is, is a massive risk, in my opinion. I, I, I mean, I want to just pick your brains on this one. And, and uh, I know Zed will ask you in a minute, he'll want to ask you about systems and Arteta um, and, and, and a Bamiang fitting into systems and whether he was a victim of that. And, and you're absolutely right. He did get them in the, the same team, uh, Emery, and he got them playing. That's absolutely correct and, and, and true. But but the exit of Aubameyang and getting him out for some, what we may, may interpret as low-level disciplinary issues, because, you know, there's a lot worse than one can do than turning up late for training. And, and OK, we know that there may have been a repeat incidence of that. But do you feel, Graham, that there's something that has happened between Arteta and Aubameyang that we may not be privy to at this moment in time that may become um, evident later on? Do you think there's something more to that? Because let's be honest, let's timekeeping is, 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 is important. There's no doubt about it. But it's so, certainly something that could have been resolved between the two parties. Could it have Because here's what my thought process would have been, is that if we couldn't get anybody through the door as a replacement for Aubameyang, then it should have been resolved between Aubameyang and the club or Arteta and Aubameyang because actually I'd rather still have him in the squad. OK, his form hasn't been great in the last few months, but if there's anyone you want on the end of finishing something in the league, it probably is someone like Aubameyang. Do you think there may have been other issues that may have contributed to Aubameyang's exit? 
Well, he seemed to be hinting at that, didn't he, in his press conference? Uh, but in Barcelona, I know he could only say so much, and I know he probably didn't want to talk about it. But but yeah, I do. I do think there's more to this, and I think there's more to come out. I, people are saying that it come out in the Amazon documentary. I think people need to understand that those Amazon documentaries, for all that, are edited, and I don't, and the club have a say in what is released. So I don't think you will find out from that. But I do think there's more to it than than just this. It, you, I agree with you. I don't don't think timekeeping alone is enough to actually warrant bombing someone out the club. Um, and I know he came back late from France, and might have. Um, and I think there was a at the time. I know there was speculation that um, there was a bit of COVID around the, the club at the time. Did this come? Did he bring it back from France or something? I don't know. Um, uh, but even if he didn't, the fact that we were in a COVID sort of situation, the club would have taken a uh, a grim view of somebody breaking that protocol in a bubble that would have come back in and possibly brought something in or risked bringing something back in, let me say. So that's that's possible. That could have been part of it. But I do think they've had a general falling out. And um, uh, the, the thing that worries me about Arteta, and uh, as much as I, I, I'll say this now, I'm not a massive Arteta in or an Arteta out. Um, I tend to sort of like judge football beyond that sort of way of looking at football. Mm. Um, I do, it does worry me the way that when he falls out with someone or the something happens and he tends mm. to bomb them, he doesn't, his man management isn't, I'm not saying it's not good enough, but he just doesn't want to resolve anything because in life you can't just keep throwing everything away. You know, it's a mm. bit like in your house, you know, if, if you, um, you know, everybody sort of like, you know, the generation I come from and, you know, walk of life I walk in, you, um, you can't just keep throwing everything away and replacing it. You know, it's, you can't afford everything. You know, so well, you have well, to... he's, never, he's never patched up. Graham, he's never patched up, has he? Let's be honest. If we go yeah. down the list, if, if you look no. at Gwendouzi, he's never patched up yeah. with Gwendouzi yeah. when there were opportunity. Uh, who else yeah. was it? Ash, uh, Ainsley uh, Maitland Niles. Ainsley There's some Maitland relief Niles. out there that he may have been sent out because of the posts on Instagram. Um, yeah. there's been issues with Saliba I mean we hope that one gets patched up because we bloody well yeah. need him next season uh, who else yeah. is there? Um, uh, there's Lucas Torreira we don't know what's happened with Lucas I, Torreira I, I, as well and I think the Torreira one is more to do with the fact he can't settle in this country I think more than yeah, yeah more I than out. But, but I do agree I do think what you're saying there is is is, is a valid point uh, and uh, what we've already been talking about There, he does seem to sort of like when he falls out of people he doesn't seem to want to or whether he possesses the man management skills, he just doesn't want to. Whether uh, it's inexperienced, uh, whether it's because they're, you know, in our uh, Alba's case, he's a big player, uh, and maybe doesn't like dealing with bigger players. I don't really know. We've been an experienced manager, but he has yeah. got a history of sort of like falling out with people and then not wanting to um, resolve the issue. You know, he tends to bomb them out of there, and um, and that's what he's done here. I, I think there's more to it than meets the eye, and I think. I think it will come out eventually. But, yeah, I agree with you. There's more to it than just timekeeping. Yeah, I think he's, he's fallen out hard with players. I think Ozil was the other example as well. Yeah, Ozil, yeah, yeah. Ozil was the other example where a big player on big wages who, you know, initially you could get stuff out of, but he just completely yeah. dropped him. Obviously, Ganduzi has been another one. Then you've got plenty of players. I mean... He, once he decides a player is not fit for his system or doesn't get with what he wants, even if he signed the player, he just doesn't play them. I think Pablo Mari is a good example. Arteta yeah. signed Pablo Mari and then just played him a couple of times. He didn't live up to what he was expecting uh, from what I can see from the outside. Obviously, there may be other things going on, but and it's completely gone. And now he's been farmed out. And I'm pretty sure he's not going to be incorporated back into the team. So. The, the, the yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think on that, I think that's a good point you make. But I think this season probably not the season to have judged it by. Bearing in mind that we're not in Europe, and also we uh, haven't. We went out in the third round of the FA Cup. Yeah. Um, and I know we went to the semis of the Carabao Cup, but um, there hasn't been the game time for a lot of players who have been on the fringes. Uh, so if you look at those players, he's now loaned out or got rid of. Uh, except to Bamiang, of course, mm. since the, since the Man City defeat back in August, when they got when we lost five nothing, I think yeah. of the five or six players who've gone either, including Chambers, who went to Villa, um, I think uh, I'm right in saying I don't think anybody apart from Maitland Niles has played 
has, has started a game. You know, yeah. The rest, of, there might have been a few sub appearances, but I think most of them haven't even played at all. So the ones no, he's, they haven't no. even been part of the squad. But but the Mari thing is a slightly separate thing. We're talking about Albert obviously uh, falling yeah, out with yeah, him. Falling and, out, and, yeah. I think I think that. And, and, but you are right. There's players who, who once they don't seem to be what he wants, he doesn't play them. But I think he he's got a bit, a bit of an excuse this season not to have played them because there simply hasn't been the games. No, I mean, the, the, there has been some chances where, where he's played Ben White in every single game where he could have probably used a rest, where he could have yeah, no. But, uh, uh, Graham, I want to ask you a question about now. The players yeah. that he has, right, the players that he has at the club now at his disposal, what yeah. is the best system fit for that? Is he going to continue to play Laka through the middle uh, yeah. and that's it for the rest of the season? Or are yeah. we going to see some innovation? Uh, I, I... I think that, that you can pretty much work out what the best Arsenal eleven is going to be, yeah. uh, and I think the four-two-three-one uh, system will be the system he goes with, and uh, the team will be obviously Ramsdale and goal, uh, Tommy Asu at right back, uh, White, Gabriel, Tierney. That'd be the back four. Obviously, yeah. we're hoping that, that Tommy Asu's over his injury, yes. and then the midfield, the midfield pivot will be Party and Jacker, and yeah. then your then your play, then he'll play Saka on the right, Odegaard in the right half space. He'll play uh, Martinelli on the left, and he'll play um, Lacazette through the middle. But obviously, he's the focal point to come short and build the play. Um, obviously, Smith Rowe is the one who come in who he might rotate occasionally. Yeah. He's got options there the way he wants to do it. If he wants to give Lacazette a rest and move Martinelli down the middle, he could then play Smith Rowe on the left. Where Smith Rowe has thrived on the left this season, playing. Yes, more, he's thrived more wide left than he has in the number ten role. I mean, yeah. last season yeah. he was. It, we, our form up termed after Christmas when he came in at number 10. But this year he's found his home on the left-hand side because he can drift into that right-half space. Yeah. Um, so I think Smith Rowe hasn't been part of the 11 that did well in December, has he? Uh, no, so no. They, since Martinelli come in the team, and I think Martinelli and Saka are always like now down those wide areas. Uh, and um, I think so unless he's going to rotate um, you know, Martinelli, if he wants to sort of ro- rotate occasionally around those four players, he can rotate in various ways. Of course, he can play Smith Rowe on, on the left and give Martinelli a, re- a rest and still play Lacquer down the middle. He could move Martinelli to, uh, down the middle and play Smith Rowe on the left. Or he could give Saka a rest on the right. Um, yeah. And if he was to do that, he could bring Pepe on, on the right. But I think yeah. I think that 11 that I've just said to you, playing in a 4-2-3-1, will be the, the, the main 11 he'll go with. Uh, in the Wolves game, if Tommy Asu is fit, yeah, and for most games, the 17 games left in the season, yeah, that I think for the Wolves game, if Tommy Asu is not fit, I almost see him playing Ben White on the right back position, and then uh, what you call holding coming in for the centre back. I think he's tried that a couple of times, hasn't he, this season? Yeah, I, I don't like it myself um, because I think it takes away what Ben White offers uh, uh, in the middle uh, in our yep. build-up play, and you saw that against Burnley. Yes. He can't over. He can't overlap down the right hand side. Uh, he hasn't got that in his, his game, and it takes away a lot of what he does. He's able to break the press. He's able to bring the ball out, uh, and and he's you know a fine distributor of the ball from that from that area. And I would have um, kept Chambers, Graham. I would have kept Chambers. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I hundred percent agree with you. Um, I would have kept Chambers as well, uh, and, and I don't understand the rationale there because. Cedric is not as good. The only thing I know about Cedric is he's on a longer contract. Whether that um, and Chambers was coming to the end of his contract, I don't yes. know if that influenced the thought process. Uh, but they and also they could get a bit of money for Chambers. I, I, I look, I, I think Chambers wasn't bad at right back last year. Uh, so, um, but I think Tommy Asu. I think Tommy Asu is the most underrated, unsung hero of our team this Agree. year. Absolutely, uh, because yeah. what he offers the team. Uh, has enabled other players to go and be what they can be, uh, and he's he's just he's he's up there with his numbers. Um, mm. you know, he's so I'm, sure, isn't he? He's so yeah. solid. Um, yeah. You don't worry at all. I mean, don't forget we've been groomed and used to watching Bellerin over there over these <laughs> last few years. So anything was an upgrade, but he's just so sure, isn't he? And so dependable. Yeah, he is. And I think just when you talk about Bellerin, I think he'll be one of the players who they'll be looking to get rid of in the summer, you know, yes. thinking about players they'll be looking to move on. I've just got some numbers here on Tommy Asu for you. Uh, 
since he's been at Arsenal uh, in our team this year. He's, his record is outstanding. Most tackles won as an Arsenal player. Most wow. aerial duels won. Most crosses blocked. And most crosses completed. So um, even going for that, so he's, and that's only despite playing in 16 of the 22 Premier League games. He's got those outstanding numbers. So it's not just what's on the, you know, what you see with your eye, what you love with your eye. It's just his numbers. Uh, are yeah, absolutely yeah. Impressive. And I think we saw in the Liverpool game when he came back, we rushed him back. He only played, yes. he volunteered to play when he wasn't even fit. I think he was 65% fit. Yeah, and bad see, decision. That Jota goal when he, I don't, I know he slipped or he, he was losing his footing, but I don't think Jota would have run past him in the way no, he, he did wouldn't. on that night. That game he no. played two months ago. So. He's rarely dribbled, dribbled, uh, dribbled Dribble past, past um, yeah. uh, Tommy Asu. And when that happened, I mean, that, you know, we said on our WhatsApp group there and then, didn't we, that um, yeah, he yeah. shouldn't have played. And, and and bringing it back to Chambers again, Graham, Chambers should have played in that game. Chambers played very yeah. well in the first leg when we went down to 10 men. Yeah, he did. I, I, you know, I, I, must have, I would have played Chambers, uh, you know, so, uh, but obviously he didn't uh, and he's gone now. So, and to pull that, I thought he was a model professional, Callum Chambers. Oh. And, uh, yeah, and, no, um, he, he was a you know, brilliant servant. Yes. Yeah, good servant for the club, yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a there's a debating matter that Zed and I have have been debating <laughs> for weeks now, or or certainly since it's 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 got a lot more prevalent since the windows closed, Graham. And we want you to be our, uh, the judge on this one. Um, yeah. Zed now seems to think that with the very limited squad that we have and the fact that we still have Pepe in the team, that they may be a role for Pepe to play in that false nine or sort of strike position, maybe giving Lacazette a rest at times. I'm I'm not really for that personally. I, I mean, I can see the pros and cons with it, uh, but but I, I, if you ask me my opinion on Pepe, he's actually, I think, best suited on the left wing where Martinelli uh, is currently occupied. Resolve this for us, Graham, because uh, Zed and I will be absolutely scratching our <laughs> eyes out eventually on this. <laughs> um, do you know what? I, I, I've long said um, that I can see a role for Pepe on the right hand side of our attack in a forward two, right? So yeah. when he played at Lille, he was somebody who used to be able to drive from deep positions, albeit in a counter attacking team, run at defenders centrally, and create or score goals and um so we exclusively used him on the right uh, you are right we've used him on the left and he was better on the left in some games that i saw um but when he's on the right he's very predictable you know he's going to come in on his left foot and mm -hmm. uh and uh, whenever it, but he's he's slow when he gets the ball and and a lot of players get around him and 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 we don't seem to move the ball quick enough and it comes back inside a lot um could i see him as a false nine i could I could see him as a false nine. Whether that would suit the way we build up low, I don't think it would. So I don't think Arteta will use him as a false nine. Uh, that's what I think. Uh, I, I'm not saying he couldn't play the role. Uh, and I'm, if Lacazette gets injured, um, could we play him up front? Maybe we could find a system to play him up front because um, if he plays up front, even if Martinelli plays up front, they're not players who can build the play or come short and, uh, with their back to go and play as effectively as what Lacazette does, but they offer different options as a forward player. So not necessarily as a false nine, but maybe play him as a forward uh, and play. Uh, you'd have to then change the shape of the team round. I think um, you could play him in a in a, a diamond four four two, or you could, uh, up up with with uh, a striker, maybe uh, either Lacquer or Martinelli down the middle with him, or or you could play him in a uh, a four-three-three, um, so, and and because Arteta systems we forget are very fluid, so there's no reason why players can't interchange in uh, systems and shapes. So he could start there, move out left, and Martinelli could come inside. Uh, so, so maybe you know I'm, I'm sort of like not really answering your question because. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't well, want well, to well, upset you, well, guys. Well, um, you've uh, got to pick no, somebody, no. mate. You've got to, let's, 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 What would you do here? Okay, this what is would I do? Well, I, 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 I think we play our best football in a four-two-three-one. No doubt yep. about it. And I don't think he fits that. 
he fits that system. So we almost like praying that we can get through the season with, with Lacazette, really. Uh, and I think if he doesn't have Lacazette, I can see maybe him playing Nketiah there instead of Pepe. And I think if he brings Pepe in, I think it'll be on in the wide areas, either more or less if Saka a rest or if Saka's injured, or maybe play him uh, out on the left and then move Martinelli down the middle if he's going to move anyone down the middle. So I don't yeah. see him doing that. But we're not really a counter-attacking team, although we have played counter-attack against the bigger teams at times during the season. But I think back to when Pepe played with Aubameyang at Anfield a few years ago in their Emery. Uh, when yeah. we lost that game 3 0, he was outstanding that day. He even outrun Van Dyke on a couple of yeah. situations and caused them problems running from deep positions. So, you know, it can, we haven't seen the best of Pepe. Uh, and I'm just no. thinking, can we get him in a, a position in a team where he can just show us something that we haven't seen yet? And, and that's one position that, you, that uh, we've been talking about, false nine or down the middle, we haven't seen. Maybe he can do that. He's very good, I think, in the right half space also, coming in on his left foot and getting away shots. And let's face it, he's a goal scorer. Uh, he and, is. And, he's uh, probably a know, last finisher season, left now, Graham. Yeah. He's probably yeah, left, so, the, the, after Aubameyang's left now, yeah, Pepe's yeah. probably our last best finisher. And what yeah. is worrying, though, with, with uh, Pepe is that when Arteta had chances to bring him on in the last few games, he chose to bring on Nketiah to play on that wing? Didn't understand it at all. I think what's worrying really is that Arteta is wielded to the same formation and that tells you that maybe he's not going to change it around too much because when Nketiah came on the other day for Smith Rowe, he literally just fitted into the same uh, place, position yeah. where Smith Rowe was playing. So it wasn't like he went down the middle or, any, or there was a change. He didn't get... Lacazette and Nketiah close together in a two. He, he just asked Nketiah to stay out wide in the Smith Rowe position. So couldn't understand it. Couldn't and understand I think he's very much wielded to the same. His subs seem like for like at times. I think that's a weakness in his management at the moment. In experience, the way he makes his subs, so he doesn't change the shape around too much. Um, so that tells me that I don't think Pepe is going to get the chance. Uh, well, Zed, uh, Graham, it is, has it is Zed, it's Zed, Zed wants him down at the false nine, is it? Or, well, I, I, I don't, I don't want on, him Zed. down. Yeah, I, I, I'm not advocating that he definitely go down uh, the centre forward position. What I'm saying is, we've been linked to players who are very similar or have the similar capability. So Alexander Isaac is one of those, right? He's a yeah. player who likes to run at players, dribble yeah. past, create a chance. When we have Pepe, why are we going and spending 75, 80 million pounds on a similar player? I, it, yeah. if, if Arteta is not happy with the type of player Pepe is, why have we been linked with a player who is not playing with his back to the goal, is more uh, ready to take on players? Even Aubameyang, to an extent, his biggest quality was his ability to beat a player one-on-one, get it on his right foot and take a shot. And we saw yeah, a lot of goals scored yeah. like that. Pepe is the opposite with the left foot, and he's been working on his right foot. So my point yeah. is, even if he is playing in the right right wing or left wing or taking over from Saka to get some rest, I think generally just Pepe deserves more time to yeah. be given. And not playing him is something that Arteta is doing that he's done to a lot of other players, which is tanking their value. So it's bad mm. business. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point you make. And I don't disagree. I think... Um... I don't think Isaac is a 70, 70, 75 million pound player. No. So, and I think the fact that we didn't really, I don't think we were really serious about getting Hopefully, him because if yeah. you were really that serious, you would have activated the release clause, which we didn't think he was worth. So the player they wanted was Vlavic. Uh, obviously, it was unsuccessful. Um, and I think then he was like the backup. If we if we can get him at cheaper, let's go for him. But you are right. Fundamentally, he is more of a, um, an inside forward. He's not really a striker and he does no. very similar things to what uh, I agree that Pepe could do. So yeah. and I'm not only four goals in 18 league games this year is not, not that, or I think it's something like four and 18. Yeah. Um, it's not great numbers, is it? So yeah, I, I, I'm glad in a way we didn't get him. I don't yes. think he would be the sort of player that I think we need coming in next season. I think, no, you know, if we're going to need an upgrade on Lacazette, really, uh, and uh, Calvert Lewin in the Premier League is the ideal candidate for me. You'd have him, of, Graham Calvert Lewin. Yeah, I would, uh, but I don't think now now that Lampard's going to Everton, you might see a resurgence at Everton, and I don't think Lampard would want to sell him. And I think the likelihood is now we're not going to get him because of that. I mean, the time would have been to get him would have been 
before Lampard came. So I, I think, um, but Calvert Lewin to me, hold up play, good in the air. Uh, bear in mind that we do sling a lot of crosses and we slung yeah, 34, yeah. 34 crosses in against Burnley and only three met their target of an Arsenal yeah, player. Yeah. If we had Calvert Lewin in there as an option, you know, it would, uh, you know, it would be better, wouldn't it? So, and I think he's, you know, he's he's obviously be overpriced, the English tax and all that, but he's the type of, and he knows the Premier League, but he'd be the type of player that I'd want. He, he's like, uh, you know, a Vlavic style of player, you know, Vlavic is the one that I would loved and um, watched in this season. You know, he, but obviously, he's, him and his agent played a crafty game to get the move he wanted. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so I don't know. There's not a lot. I think the English game now is evolving away from maybe centre forwards. If you look at the the way the football is in the world right now, there's not many top quality number nines. I mean, Lukaku's no, come back. I mean, apart from Haaland at Dortmund, I, I don't know of too many players who, you know, if you look in the in, in the Premier League at the moment, Lukaku and Kane. I know. Uh, Kane got a couple in the cup yesterday, but Kane and Lukaku haven't been really scoring this season, have they? In the number nine, no, world. no, they're not. And look at the, the goal scorers in the league. It's your wide forwards like your Salas and your Manes, and yeah. even your midfielders who've been scoring the goals. Even Smith Rowe. Uh, and and, for and us, that's, that, and, and that's exactly the point where I'm trying to make with Pepe. He's a goal scorer who comes off yeah. of the wing like Salah yeah. in the left. Yeah. Obviously, not the same quality. Let's let's not get it wrong, right? Yeah. So that's the way. And Man City have won a league title nearly without a forward, without a striker, yeah. without a number nine. So football in front of our eyes is evolving such that we don't need a number nine anymore. And yeah. I don't want to raise this, but Vlavic has just scored for for Juventus. <laughs> right, Thirty minutes I think, in. I think, yeah, I think just just to wrap up on this subject, I think yeah. the thing about the, uh, Pepe is if you look at the way Liverpool use Salah, Salah yeah. is all about pace. So what they yes. know is they want to get the ball forward quickly to Salah and uh, Salah and Mane, and get them one on one with their with their defender and, yes. and get them in positions where they can. Get a shot away at goal and run at players and create from there with that use their pace. Pepe has got pace, but we don't build up. We are more of a possession based possession team. Based like, yeah, build yeah. up, build up through the thirds and then go wide to our wide players. Um, we don't knock the ball forward quickly uh, as much as I would like. Whereas Liverpool, if you look at the way Liverpool play, when they have Salah and Mane in the team, they are just their midfielders are just tasked with getting it quickly. To, to to Salah and Mane to get them in positions where they can influence the game. You know, yeah, they play yeah. a lot. In tra- they play a lot in transition, Liverpool, don't they? Yes. Uh, and that's what they're looking to do. Whereas we are more of a counter, uh, sorry, a, a possession based side, yeah. which doesn't suit Pepe. Pepe was good in a Lille team that was more a transition team, yeah. counter attack team. So he doesn't really suit the way Arteta wants to play. That's the problem. No. Um, speaking of which, Graham. Uh, so again, another sort of pertinent matter this is our sort of wrap up issue now yeah um and and you know we definitely if you're available for us want to get you on again and let's, yeah, let's sure. review this sort of down the line but yeah. where this, this this is certainly a subject now we we are a team now that are exceeding expectations we you know if, if 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 the way we finished last season and how things were going certainly the beginning of the season and our early games lost this season if you'd have offered us at christmas that we were in or thereabouts a the top four most fans would have taken your hand off and said yeah we'll have it anyway we're there now we beat wolves on on thursday and we're back in the top four we you know Tottenham have got cont- games that are coming up that are going to be difficult we've got difficult games but we've got a run of games that actually if we win the right games and we get the right points we're really in the mix for top four now the question that i want to ask you and, and zed i'll get your view separately on this in a, in, a, in a minute as well is should now Arteta be under that kind of pressure? Now, we, 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 we discussed a little bit about this offline. Bear in mind, there's should or would. We know exactly what will happen. Arteta is here for the long stay. They're even looking to extend his contract. What I'm asking you here now, Graham, is, is if we do not achieve that top four ambition this season, even if we finish one point outside of the top four, um, should Arteta... A, say at the club, or B, should he be rewarded with a new contract? So, you know, there's fact that there's, there's perspectives at the moment that actually he's in his third season. We should be, he's spent a lot of money. 
this is more or less the team that he wants. I mean, we've had an exit of, of a lot of players in this window as well. So we're there or thereabouts, his team, so to speak. Should he now be, given the fact that we can compete for it and we're nearly there or potentially there, should he remain as Arsenal manager if we do not qualify for the Champions League this season, Graham? Before I answer that question, if I'd said to you at the start of the season where you thought Arsenal would finish this season, where would you have said? Gosh, you're going to ask me that, Graham. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought we would finish this season in the European places, but certainly not in the top four. Right. So if the, so that, that, in a way, is what I thought. When I looked at the start of the season, I honestly believed that Liverpool, Man City would be, and Chelsea would be competing for the title. Uh, Chelsea, because they'd made those signings. Obviously, it hasn't worked out for Chelsea, although they're not totally out of it, but I don't think they're going to compete for the title. I think it's between Man City and Liverpool. I accept, expect Man City to win the league. I think Liverpool will finish second. Chelsea will finish third. That's the top three, and they are on a different level to the rest of the league. Yeah. Now, I expected Man United, who've got the a great squad with great players, with the additions they made. They brought in Ronaldo, Sancho, Varane, on top of all those good players they had. It looked to me at the start of the season, they would be in the top four, right? Uh, and um, But they have been so poor this year that they've opened the door that is leading to this sort of debate we're having now around whether Arsenal should get top four. At the start of the season, we have not got the fourth best, uh, we've not got one of the four best squads in the league. We have got no depth in our squad, even less depth in our squad now. But I didn't expect us to get top four. So if he doesn't get top four, albeit the door was ajar, and so you could argue that because that's a jar, because we haven't had European football, it's not unreasonable to expect top four. If he doesn't quite get it, I don't think he should go if we're talking about should he go. Now, will he go? I don't think he will go because, I, as I've said to you when we were talking before we came on air tonight, I think they're so wielded to him. I think he's here for the long haul, I do, unless it goes absolutely horribly wrong, which I don't think it will. So I don't think we'll get top four. I'll be honest, it's a chance. I don't expect us to get top four. Uh, and that's just, um, I didn't expect it pre-season. I don't expect it now after what's happened in this window. I think we've left ourselves now in a position where it, it, everything's got to go terribly right for us to get it now. Bearing in mind we're up against a resurgent Man United, albeit they went out the cup on Friday. And uh, Tottenham now got Conte. So... And even then, you've got, I mean, West Ham and Wolves uh, have impressed, impressed me this year at times. So they're going to be knocking on the door with us. So where do I think we are? I agree with you. I think we are, I expected us to get fifth or sixth. Six is the absolute uh, minimum requirement, uh, I would have thought, for Arsenal this season, which is an improvement on last season. We need to be back in Europe. We need to be back in the Champions League, really, a club the size of Arsenal. But I think we've downed our expectations. And let me explain to your uh, subscribers and yourselves why I think that. Because what they've done now is they've literally bought into young players for the future. So when they did away with all the experienced heads as he's been clearing them out and we've decided to get the dead wood out, he literally went out and bought young players. If you look at our team, we are like the youngest team, I think. He's put out the youngest team in the league at times this season. So we are a young team, a young squad. So with that comes the, I think, uh, you have to accept that, that, that there's going to be inconsistencies and you can't expect it as big a club as Arsenal are to just um, get back in the Champions League straight away. I think it's a building process. So a lot of your people who listen to this won't like to hear that, but I think that's what the club, uh, the direction the club decided to take, um, albeit they made some good signings in the window back in yeah. August, but so I I suspect that um, I think we'll finish in the top six. Um, so is that good enough for Arsenal Football Club? It's not. Should he get a new contract for that? Absolutely not. Should um, should he be sacked? If he was at any other club but Arsenal, he would be. Uh, and and that's the fact. We don't act like a big club. And the reason we're in that position, in my opinion, is. Is because for years we've allowed the club to stagnate, and that's not all his fault or Edo's fault. And uh, so I think you have to give him a little bit, of, cut him a bit of slack around that. But that's just um, no, what I, I feel. I, I absolutely um, agree with you, Graham. I think um, 
the expectation at the start of the season was not to finish in top four, so he shouldn't be judged yeah. to be on top four, right? If he makes it, honestly, one of the best things he's ever done, that would, that would be mm. equivalent, right, to FA Cup for me, essentially, because we haven't been in the Champions League yeah. for so long. And the revenue that will bring the club, it will allow it to grow. Yeah. I 100% agree with you on the fact that he's built a team for the future. So, mm. for me, if he gets into Europe, I think that's a good season. That's a good season for Arsenal. A run in the Carabao Cup semi-final, which I think we left ourselves short on that on ourselves. There was no one to blame but Arsenal Football Club for that loss because yeah. Liverpool were there for the taking. They they had players away. So, yeah. I think sixth, anything... Sixth or fifth is brilliant, and Europa League obviously the best. But co- even Conference League, I would say fine. I think the club will stick with him for at least another two seasons, give him time to build his squad. This group of players who are all under 23s to grow and you know get to their peak, so they can see what they can do. But yeah, it has to be a long-term project. The Arsenal aren't the football club who, whether they have the money or not have the money, they're not going to spend you know, 100 million on a player. And they've, you know, spent uh, big on players before and it's not worked out for them. So they're going in a different strategy, different transfer yeah. strategy. I, I, policy. I, I, do think, I, I do think this summer is absolutely massive, though, because I, yes. I think mm, yes. uh, you, uh, you will you will see a lot of these loan deals, people will go. Mario will be gone, Bellerin yes. will be gone. Yep, uh, I think Leno and Runison will be gone. Um, and I think... There's four at the top of my head. I think there'll be more that will be gone. I think Torreira uh, will be gone. I think Torreira will, will be gone. gone. Probably, possibly Maitland Niles will even be gone. Maitland Niles uh, will be gone as well. I think there's about 100 million that they're probably yeah. be looking to bring in. Oh, that's what the yeah. rough estimate of all the players, including yeah. Mavroponos, who's in strict guard. Yeah, right he's now, the right? other one. Yeah, Mavroponos. He's the other one. Mavroponos, yeah. who's, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's boosted his value as well. So all yeah. of these players going will give him a bigger war chest yeah, plus the... whatever he has on top. Yes. To get a player to get his players. Yeah. But I think what he's going to need now, they've left themselves in a position now where they're going to need to spend big on a, a strike and also get yes. a quality number two striker number and two, also they need striker, to strengthen, yeah. strengthen central midfield. Um, that's up straight away. So there's a lot of a lot hinging on the summer window. The, my only worry is if they don't get Europe, and it's by no means absolutely nailed on guaranteed, if you think yes, that the top, of course. If there's Man United, Tottenham, Arsenal, West Ham, even Wolves, um, and there's um, there's only three European positions up the grabs: one in the Champions League and one two in Europa. I know you got that European Conference, but that's, <laughs> and that's, that's it. I mean, I'd rather not be in that, to be fair. Yeah. But 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 the reality is, if you don't get a European, even li- absolute limit, the Europa, mm-hmm. when you're trying to attract players in the summer, and this is the risk when they didn't do the business now. now. Yeah, they, I, mean, I know it's notoriously difficult to get players in January, although we have done it in the past. In fact, Aubameyang came in January, of course. Yeah, but yeah. but, the, but the, the danger is if we were to fall away and finish outside the top six, which is not beyond the bounds of impossibility. Um, no. I don't expect it, but it could happen, of course. Um, if we didn't, then you're struggling to attract the players. And it's all right, Arteta saying, when, the, when the, you knock the door, it's a different knock when it's Arsenal. I think most players now, want to play in the Champions League or at least in Europe and you don't yep. get the calibre of the players you want unless you're in European competition and that's the risk. And so I just hope and pray that, that basically the main players in this squad uh, can stay fit and carry us over the line. The problem is Lacazette uh, coming to the end of his contract, um, you know, whether he's going to be able to stay fit and do it. He's not scoring the goals that we would like, but he offers something to the team. But the, the thing I'm worried about more than anything is um, just to close on this point is um, what I'm worried about these young players like your Sackers your Smith Rose your mm-hmm. Martinelli you, they've not been in a position before in the run down to the end of a season where you're challenging for top four even top six and, and the pressure that comes with that you know so they, they've been playing their football free just playing the, um, the way they want to play but when you're under pressure coming to the back end of a season They've not been in that position before. We don't know yet how they're going to react to it. I hope that, mm-hmm. you know, Lacazette and some of the senior players, who some of those senior players have let us down during the season, but they can guide them through that because that is a, a massive pressure on such... These players, you forget, Saka's only 20 years old. Yeah, People yeah. forget that. I mean, my son's the same age. So, um, and, and my, well, my fear is if we, if we don't 
suddenly in the next couple of years get this together. Will Saka, Martinelli and Smith Rowe, albeit the hell in, hell in two of those uh, young lads, will they want to commit their futures to a club who probably can't give them the standard of football very and the trophies that they want in their career? Yeah. So so it's a very important... Or deserve. That we, or deserve. Yeah. Or deserve, yeah. So it's very important that we, first of all, achieve our goals this season of European football, at least. Uh, and also the team carries on evolving next season and, and improving and getting to the level so that we can build a team around these young players to give them... Uh, the tools to be what they need to be because if we don't there is a danger that they might not be here in a few years and Absolutely. and then the club's going even further backwards so that's a yeah. you know a sobering thought to sort of like round up on the conversation on this isn't it no but, no but, yeah. no, but, but i think just uh found it all up i think i think if he gets a new contract i'll be not too happy with that i don't think he deserves one I think they were doing it because they heard of interest from Man City, but I think Guardiola is not leaving now from what, you know, you, you've taken or pick and choose the bit of gossip you hear on social media at times. But I think they were trying to nail him down, worried that City might be coming in a year's time if Guardiola went. But um, I think um, I think he's here for the long haul anyway. Um, I don't think we've ever got the squad to get top four. Uh, basically, we're not in the top four squads in the country. Uh, I think we are certainly should be in the top six. And, and if he doesn't get, that's a minimum requirement for me. Uh, and it's an improvement on last year, which buys him a bit more time, a bit like the FA Cup win bought him time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think next year is a real crucial year for me. Uh, and it starts yep. in the summer, getting the players in that we need. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks, Graham. No, you're absolutely right. I think we're all on the same page with that one. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, Arteta will probably still be Arsenal manager by the time we reach your age, Graham. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Graham, listen, mate. It has been amazing talking to you. We could go on for hours and hours. Um, we definitely want to get you on again, my friend, if you yeah, could. Yeah, I'll, more I'll, commit, I'll, commit, I'll commit to come back once a month, you guys, if that's okay oh, with you guys. That would be brilliant. Oh, of course, brilliant. mate, of course. Uh, I mean, what we've, you know, from what we've covered today, listening to Graham, his insight, his, 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 his connection to AFTV and how that all started to your deep technical analysis and where we're going to go as a team. Um, it's been fascinating, guys. And look, we do hope that... Um, Graham plugs us as well and helps grow the channel as well. That would be brilliant. Graham, if you could do that for us. Yeah, cool. Yeah, you got my word on that, mate. Zed, final words from you? Oh, mate, I just, I would just like to thank Graham, honestly. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Graham, honestly. Uh, you've, you've been my inspiration. And talking to you, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be, you know, fangirling here. But honestly, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And I, I, as Ari says, I can go on for hours and hours talking just Arsenal with you. Thank you very much for coming on. No, it's been a real privilege and a pleasure. And I'm, it means a lot that I'm the first guest on your pod. I wish you guys all the best with it. I will try and grow it for you. And maybe, you know, you get lead judges or one or two guys I know to come on occasionally, you know. I'll, I'll get them to uh, maybe... They are the all pit. welcome, Graham. All welcome. Yeah. If you could talk to them, that would be brilliant. Yeah. I appreciate that, Graham. Thank you very much. Um, you. Guys, yeah, um, well, it's been a real sorry. pleasure. Uh, yeah, just finishing. Real pleasure. I say thanks for inviting me on. Uh, and definitely be plugging it for you guys and uh, as I say great luck with the channel and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you both uh, and I've really enjoyed it so thank you very good. much good thank you very much good. Graham thank you guys I've been Harry Carney you can catch me on uh, Harry uh, Carnu Harry underscore Carnu uh, at Twitter Zed do you want to plug your own Twitter? Yeah, uh, you can catch me on Z at the All Gunners podcast, but with the letters, so T-A-G-P, so Z underscore T-A-G-P. Graham? Well, obviously, uh, um, when I'm not on AFTV, same old Arsenal and Lee Judges, uh, my Twitter handle is uh, GrahamB195. I follow back all Arsenal fans. I love engaging with Arsenal fans. So GrahamB195, you always find me at. And uh, uh, always be a pleasure to talk Arsenal with. You know, I love talking to Arsenal fans. I didn't go on AFTV for fame and fortune or anything like that. I, I just went on there really to engage with Arsenal fans around the world and uh, talk about our great club. Uh, and, it's, you know, and I'm always looking to meet new, make new friends, even at my age. And uh, I think I've made two tonight. So, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Oh, thank you, oh, Greg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you on episode four next week. Take care and stay safe. Goodbye.